All right, I'm Mike Mimoso. I'm here with Katie Masuris of Hacker One, and we're going to talk a little Wassenaar. So it's been about nine months or so mm -hmm. since uh, they took the draft that was originally proposed off the table. I know you've done a little bit of work um, in the interim on Wassenaar. Give us an update. Where do things stand? When do we see the next draft? Okay, well, let's clarify who they Big are, right? They, right? Who is they? Uh, the U.S. is about to is yes. trying to implement the export control rules that will help the United States comply with the Vassanar arrangement, um, where Vassanar has been altered since 2013 right. to include intrusion software, surveillance software, and most importantly, intrusion software technology. So, U.S.'s uh, proposal um, was drafted and, and released for comment May 20th of last mm -hmm. year. You're asking for the update. I'm asking for the update. Okay. So There's a lot of convoluted, vague language in that original uh, draft that made a lot of people nervous, obviously. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the reason it was it was so nerve-wracking, especially the proposed U.S. implementation, the original one, um, was that it didn't carry any exemptions whatsoever. Right. Um, and so there were no mass market exemptions, for example, so Metasploit Pro would have been affected, um, even though it, you know, the open source version of it wouldn't have been export controlled. So there is a lot of, you know, nuance in there right. where, uh, where really useful tools that defenders use to test mm -hmm. their security would have been caught up in this dragnet. Right. Um, so where are we right now? Uh, the U.S. has publicly said that they are going to do a second draft, and they are actually going to, you know, uh, do another comment period. Now, even the first comment period for uh, the U.S.'s proposed export control rule was actually an unprecedented move by the right. United States. And so you could tell that they're in that deliberation to open that up for comment, they knew that they needed industry and the security research community in the United States to really look at this language and weigh in. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going for a second draft in the United States. But as far as I have heard, Penn has not hit paper um, for the second draft. And we're running out of time right. in sort of the current administration, because typically you don't pass very controversial uh, new items um, at the tail end of a presidential administration. Right. So it's highly likely that we're going to see some movement, um, you know, not just in, in the United States, but actually in some of the other 41 countries that are all member states part of the Wassenaar uh, arrangement. Right. So. Ideally, um, and I've been saying this since the beginning, ideally what we'll see are some changes that pull out this troublesome language that acts as this broad dragnet. Um, I, I would love to see the, the entire, you know, the entire amended uh, clause taken out. That would be ideal for me. But, right. um, but barring that, you know, if we can get, uh, if we can get the particulars about intrusion software technology because it's that keyword technology that they thought they were they thought they were scoping it narrowly, but actually that broadened the scope quite a bit. Mm -hmm. If that piece gets taken out, uh, I think we'll be in much better shape in terms of implementation. It's that pesky word technology. <laughs> well, I mean, it, the reason it wasn't intrusion software itself that right. was controlled is because they didn't want to catch victims. So mm -hmm. victims who were infected with the intrusion software, they didn't want to, them to be in violation of export controls if they carried an infected device across a border. Right. And so it, you know, it makes sense in the if you think about regulations and legislation as as you know legal code, that code can have flaws too. Mm -hmm. And so when they threat modeled that code that they were writing, um, you know, they basically just didn't take into account that it it ended up being a lot broader. So when we're talking about intrusion software, we're talking about stuff like the hacking team was developing and Finn Fisher and some of the other nasty stuff that's used to monitor people in, in other places of the world. We've had a conversation about this before, and you talked about kind of the, the difference the way that Europe and the rest of the world looks at it as opposed to the U.S., where it's more of a, a national security hang-up in the U.S. and other places. They, they consider the human rights aspect to it a little bit more, make it more of a priority. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and originally, you know, the, the reason why uh, there was pressure to do something about this software being exported was because of human rights concerns right. and that was basically you know this software can be used to spy on political dissidents journalists activists um, you know and it was found you know hacking team in particular but what's funny is that a lot of that surveillance software it actually wouldn't have really been caught up in uh, in the in the Vassanar language. Um, a lot of it, you know, was is designed to bypass the protective countermeasures. Well, if you actually saw the hacking team malware for uh, for mobile devices, 
it required the user to click through and give all the permissions. Did you see, you know, uh, Ruben Paul's demo right. this morning where he it was he did an incredible demo, but there were lots of user warnings thrown. So you know, that wouldn't have qualified in, in a strict sense because the user is is giving permission. It's not, that, that malware wasn't designed to bypass the protective countermeasures. The user was bypassing them by clicking through. Right. And so you look at this as the defenders who need to know about, you know, protective countermeasure bypasses are not going to be able to get access to that information, whereas the criminals will be able to use techniques like phishing and the usual stuff to get what they want and achieve their objectives anyway. So where's the disconnect? Who's missing the point and where on this? Well, I think that, you know, there's there's a process that, that these folks go through where they consult technical advisors, mm -hmm. um, and they did so, but I think what was really useful that came out of this exercise, you know, never waste a good crisis, right. is that they, they identified technical experts who were more clearly and consciously aware of how vulnerability coordination works, mm -hmm. about how, um, you know, how some of this technology is really useful on the defense side. And so now we have the identification of security experts who are willing Willing to work with policymakers and regulators on this particular subject who actually do have the special technical yeah. knowledge. So they did try to do some consulting mm -hmm. with technical folks. They just didn't have uh, they didn't have the right ones on the books yet. And now I think they do. This is an interesting time for the security community too. They've almost grown up. A lot of people are turning activists. A lot of people made their voice heard with this. I think there were 300 comments during the comment period. A lot of them not just from vendors, but you know, folks like yourself. Um, What's your take on, on that part of this? Um, I think, well, of those 300 comments, you know, a lot of them were trolls. But, um, True. but True. I think, I think the, the awakening and the realization, and, and some of what my talk is going to be about tomorrow, the awakening and realization of the security community that you don't just have to be heads down in your technical work. You have to pay attention to the world around you and what lawmakers and legislators are doing. And right now is a huge uptick in proposed cyber regulation, legislation yeah. across not just the United States, but across the world. And so it's time for all of the technical experts to make themselves available, not all the time like I do as a policy officer. Sure. This, was, this was what I decided to do with myself. Um, you know, but make yourselves technically available when you are called upon um, in order to provide the expertise to make sure mm -hmm. that the world that we are starting to regulate more and more yeah. is, is not having unintended consequences by those regulations. So last question, um, we've got a few months until this pesky election is over. What's your best guess as to what is going to happen? What, what needs to happen first before we get to some to, a, to another draft? Well, there's a lot that is going to go on in terms of experts talking to experts with the uh, Wassenaar. It's, it's essentially, they have meetings before the plenary meeting right. in December. And so there will be a lot of opportunities for discussion. So what I am poised to see and I hope to see is several countries coming forward with proposed revisions for that pesky language um, that's causing so much trouble at the root. Right. Great. Thanks for joining me. All right. Thank you. All